The following is a presentation of the Force Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is a Force Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Napsack. And I'm Joseph Scrimshaw, and this is one of our News and Cues episodes. The news stands for news, and the cues stands for questions. And we have answers for your questions, both in uh, the Star Wars universe and, and maybe the podcast itself. We'll explain in a second here. <laughs> hey, uh, this podcast is brought to you. That sounded aggressive. Hey! Hey! Uh, we just want to remind you all, as always, that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. A little bit later, as always, as well. We'll give you our Force Center recommends an audiobook we think you you should try out on us, but Joseph, that is not all. It is not. We also have another offer. I like this tradition, so I'm going to say, hey, listen, <laughs> here's what we have to tell you about. Inside Editions is a publisher of a ton of great Star Wars books. They're offering 35% off across their website if you use this special link, insideditions.com slash discount slash FC35. This week, we're recommending a new book. Uh, Ken and I were both lucky enough to receive a copy. It is beautiful and strange and tiny it is the mini book of lightsabers uh it's got some of the kind of similar art uh of the the lightsaber collection book that we recommended so much because we enjoyed but it's just it's this little tiny flip book of lightsabers it's beautiful right i'm holding it right now that is the sound of this book it is uh in a world of wonderful, large, 30-pound Star Wars books, which I love and will <laughs> still continue to buy. More on those later. This little book, uh, the mini book of lightsabers, is great. It's uh, Like I said, it's a continuation of the the book that came out before, but there's some new uh, material, High Republic Jedi, uh, all, uh, all, the, all the way through it there. It's just fun. It's just fun that Star Wars can be enjoyed in big and small ways. Literally. Yeah, it's just like it's alphabetical too, which is great because you can be like flip through and go, mm -hmm. like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Who's who's a lightsaber do I want to look at? And yeah, yeah having received the uh, the uh, Star Wars um, prequel era, uh, you know, a Tashin mm -hmm. book that's so huge. It's, yeah. It looks like these two books are doing a Pixar movie together. It's a little <laughs> tiny Star Wars book and a huge Star Wars book. Go on an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. if you want tiny lightsaber books, you can use the link insideditions.com slash discount slash FC35. Great stuff. Indeed. Uh, we always like to catch up with Star Wars The Life Adventures. And I got to tell you, had a boring week, Joseph. Just a lot of work. <laughs> uh, you know, eating right, working out more, sore because of it all. I, I, you know, Star Wars, one of those weeks where Star Wars, I started Midnight Horizon for our, our deep dive discussion. I didn't watch any Star Wars content, and that's okay. And I think that's part of the Star Wars life adventure for me, for all of you listening. There's sometimes we as fans, what am I doing to love Star Wars today? You know, maybe today's uh, the day you like pizza more. I don't know. <laughs> Star Wars is always going to be there. It was a good week to just kind of not take a break and take the foot off the gas, Joseph, but just kind of be like, I am a Star Wars fan always and forever. I don't need to prove it today. Yeah, what a terrifying choice, though, to imagine getting up in the morning. And uh, uh, today <laughs> you must pick between Star Wars and pizza. Right? <laughs> I totally know what you mean, though, um, because that was kind of a little bit of one of my big life adventures is is making room for some other stuff I love uh, as well as Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a giant Beatles fan. And I remember there's at one point in my life I, I realized I had forgot all the answers to the trivia questions I used to know. And it let, I felt <laughs> I felt as though I let my 14 year old self down. And that's just not the right energy. I'm a Beatles fan then, now and forever. And I will be so with Star Wars. Exactly. And I'm sure there's some point in your life where you've been eating pizza, listening to the Beatles and looking at a Star Wars book all at the same time. If I haven't, there will now. <laughs> Excellent. So that was really it. No, no other uh, Star Wars or life adventures you wanted to share? No, I started, you know, I uh, really wanted to make notes in this section uh, uh, on the notes because usually I just go a little more off the cuff in this section. But I was like, no, I want to make sure I, I don't forget things. So I sat down this morning, a cup of coffee. It's like, what did I do in Star Wars? <laughs> ah, I didn't do anything. That's crazy. That is crazy, but good. Yeah, it's absolutely good, which is funny because the main thing that I want, I have two things I want to share, uh, but one of the, the big ones is I went to uh, this Doctor Who convention in Los Angeles, Gallifrey One. Um, I went there just on Friday. Um, it's a whole weekend convention, but I had some other life stuff going on this weekend, so I couldn't be there all weekend. And I've been to it, you know, for many years now, uh, sometimes performing on the main stage, sometimes just doing a, a few comedy panels, but also just being there as a fan of Doctor Who. 
And we get that question a ton on Force Center and sometimes in real life of like, do you ever get sick of Star Wars? Is there a limit <laughs> right. to your love of Star Wars? And I always think about it as my only limit on my love of Star Wars is I want to make sure that there's room to love other things as well. Yeah. And it's so much fun to go to this Doctor Who convention and uh, there's other things represented there as well, including Star Wars, but just really like immerse myself in a different fandom for a, a week mm, yeah. <laughs> or a weekend, you know. Uh, so that was really great. Uh, the I felt very uh, safe there because everything was uh, vaccinated and masked mm. um, and uh, got to do a couple of uh, really fun comedy panels where it's just like, who's who's the scariest monster in Doctor Who? And one that's just like let's let's riff and like it's like a game show just make jokes about doctor who right wow. um so they're total comedy panels and i realized like this is the first time that i have come close to performing live in two years which was huge oh, yeah. like that first time i got a laugh i was like oh yeah i haven't heard that in real life <laughs> to hear like you know uh 50 60 100 people i can't don't know how many people are in the panel room laughing right yeah uh, and then the fun of like uh, other people are making jokes, great jokes on the panel too. And I'm getting to laugh and enjoy it and be in that bubble of just mm. laughing and enjoying and having fun in person. <laughs> yeah. No muting. There's no way the internet can go out on that. It was so beautiful yeah. and so healing. Yeah. Did you, was there any part of you where you're like, uh Oh, the drug it's returned. <laughs> no, I've been thinking about this a lot because I, I want to get back to performing. It, it's yeah. so hard to uh, balance everything, but every time that I've been, about to start, you know, kind of pulling the trigger. And and I know you you had a window there uh, yeah. where you were performing a, a ton with Mark Ellis. I thought it was great and I was really happy for you. And I kept thinking about like, well, when do I want to get back to it? And every time I've been about to, uh, honestly, there's been another wave, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in particular with this most recent wave, the place that I would have wanted to perform, I know that there'd be no way that they're doing performances yet uh, right. kind of thing. So, you know, it's been a real choice for me to not, be performing live and it was just great to have it back and uh hope to have it uh back again in a more regular way at some point in my life soon enough and, and yeah yes yeah, sub note we currently have no tour shows planned because <laughs> because of recent surges so yeah 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 <laughs> yeah uh but even even totally immersed in doctor who uh there's overlap it's such an incredibly uh friendly uh convention very much like the vibe of star wars celebration but uh for doctor who so like there was a uh, one mandalorian who was just a straight up mandalorian wandering around uh there was one uh, mandalorian who had made special mandalorian armor uh that made them look like a uh gallifreyan uh <laughs> time lord security agent uh mixed with the mandalorian it, this is great. great. Star Wars uh, follows me everywhere. Uh, so <laughs> that was just a ton of fun. Uh, and then on Sunday, the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, I kind of opened the Razor Crest. <laughs> oh, that's right. You got the crest. It's that's so bad. big. We talked about it last mm -hmm. week. It's so big. And I wanted to find a special time to open it. So I had a nice conversation with my wife and was like, I, I need some quality Razor Crest time. <laughs> And I did put on some music and pour a little whiskey and uh, yeah. get some physical exercise trying to first pull the actual Razor Crest box out of the shipping box and then trying to pull the Styrofoam actual Razor Crest out of the Razor Crest box. I physically went through a lot. It was, yeah, no. it, it felt less like opening a toy and more like some kind of like, am I birthing the Razor Crest? It was weird. <laughs> It was like a lot of work. And then uh, I looked at all the components, I really celebrated the action figures. They're great uh, that come with it. Uh, they're all, you know, totally unique in their packaging and their design. It's all great. Uh, but then the actual Razor Crest putting it together is like uh, I was describing it to you off the air. For me, it's like the instruction booklet is like Ikea, but not quite as clear. Yeah, <laughs> and right. that's just for me because I don't do, I don't put together Lego. I don't put together model kits. It's a skill set I don't spend a lot of time on. So I'm sure for some people it's like, yeah, it's no problem whatsoever. But for me, it was like, okay, that's as far as I can go. I'm going to put this aside now and I'm going to finish constructing the Razor Crest next yeah. week. It's dangerous, man. That's where my temper starts to expose itself a little bit. Uh, coming to the light is, uh, is that building things. Not my thing. So God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's weird baggage I have, too, of like, yeah, okay, I got to snap these pieces together. But I just, I love these toys so much, and I'm mindful that I want them to exist uh, forever. And, like, I feel like putting on gloves, and, like, I want to work in a museum when I touch a toy, you know? Like, oh, I know yeah. they're meant to be built. I know they're meant to be played with. But for myself, that's, that's a little bit of a, a thing that I go through, too. Yeah. 
No, I love that. I love what you're saying about that. And and, and, and the Razor Crest, the whole process from you uh, supporting the crowdfund campaign to getting it now and even then having to build it once you get it is is a test in patience. It's the test in Star Wars patience. It really is. But it is it's beautiful and the box is, itself is great. So I'm extremely happy I got it and I can't wait to finish putting it all together. Can't wait for some good uh, cocktail photos next to the Razor Crest. <laughs> Notes is coming. Oh, it will be happening. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, I already posed my uh, my din action figure that uh, come my soft goods cape din jar and action figure will be appearing with some whiskey. I'm sure. Love that. Well, that's a great Star Wars adventure uh, in your house and at a convention. Uh, and even though mine was a little boring, I think you made up for it with two big <laughs> adventure spots. <laughs> we um, can share our life adventures. Yeah, indeed. Uh, before we get to the news, we do want to talk a little bit about the podcast and, and some exciting news and some updates as we head into March of 2022, which is insane to say. Uh, Joseph, uh, how do we, uh, we, we, we kind of discussed this plan, but we're also going off a little off the cuff here. Let's just say this. Um, last week, we were blessed by the presence of the wonderful Jennifer Landa. For newer listeners of, of the show, Jennifer was uh, is and, uh, one of the co-founders of the podcast and was a regular presence around here until life kind of uh, took her away. And by life, I mean actual life. Her second uh, child being born, uh, uh, changing location, living locations just made it more difficult to get to our in-person recording sessions. But now that we're digital and virtual right now, it, it was the right time. And uh, we are proud to announce that beginning in March, Jennifer Landa will be joining us when she can. There's still going to be some days where maybe it might not work uh, for a all Star Wars news episode. Joseph, that's exciting. Yeah, we are so, so excited that uh, the stars uh, have finally aligned. I guess the Star Wars have finally aligned <laughs> <laughs> that it works for Jennifer uh, to come back on a, on a regular basis. And in order to kind of make that happen and make it work for everybody and uh to be honest to make sure that we have uh, enough time to talk about everything we want to yeah. uh with jennifer we're going to be recording uh, all three of us uh a news and life star wars adventures update so it'll be much like the show you're listening to the news and cues show um well where all three of us will talk about our star wars and life adventures and then we'll dive into uh, the most recent news or sometimes the news from a week ago because we missed it um <laughs> But that will be the show. And uh, we only have so much recording time with Jennifer, and we don't want to rush through any of it. We don't want to rush through the life adventures, the news, and we certainly don't want to rush through uh, listener questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to break out the questions segment of news and cues and make it its own show. And Ken and I will still be uh, taking your questions. And sometimes it's the questions, Ken, where we really spiral into, we thought this was a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's something about the philosophy of Star Wars or people ask such great questions about uh, uh, how Star Wars impacts uh, our real lives that we spiral off in these great conversations and we want to make sure that we have uh, a room to spiral a little bit. So yeah. uh, news in, in life adventures is going to be one show with all three of us. And then the cues is going to be its own show with Ken and I. Yeah. I do think podcasting is the art of trying to control your rambling as best you can. Uh, it is a certain <laughs> art of uh, broad broadcasting, but uh, uh, that's going to be that. So yeah, news on Tuesdays, uh, answers on Wednesdays, Thursdays, uh, the deep dives that uh, we, we love doing, love presenting to all of you, uh, whether it be a scene by scene, going to a specific, maybe a, a hot button uh, debate that's we, that we can dive into it the way we do, or just looking back or looking forward, all those things that you know and come to love for the deep dive will remain on Thursdays. And then for uh, the time being in March, the return of the Clone Wars report as we look at start looking at season five. Uh, we're going to work our way all the way up to go going through season seven again, even though that's how the Clone Wars start <laughs> report started with that season. We're going to go through it again and see what we've uh, what time and, uh, and and more information is done to our experience with that show. So we're even going to review that uh, four issue uh, uh, Clone Wars uh, comic book arc with the the son of Dathomir. Yeah, as, as well. And then we're going to keep with uh, Star Wars Ranked, uh, maybe occasionally Spotlight Star Wars or some other kind of programming on Sundays for now. Is that a lot of content? Well, yes, it is. But we are so thankful you're always here for the journey. But some of the shows will be a little shorter. Maybe you can digest on your way to work, over your lunch break, and some when you could want to get to them, the deeper dives, those will still be the full length. That's a full slate, Joseph. It is a full slate, but I'm really, really uh, excited about it. I'm so excited about Jennifer's return. I'm so excited about the uh, different perspectives uh, that she brings. And I just, I I love doing this podcast in, in any combination of us various hosts. But there's a special just kind of um, fun when it's all three of us. And I'm really yeah. looking forward uh, to that, having that, that fun approach to the news. 
Yeah, and and a lot of you have been, uh, you know, hey, when's she gonna come back? Can she come back? Some some uh, some of you know maybe more the story of hey, it wasn't it was kind of hard for her to come back. It just was the right time. And again, no pressure. Like some weeks she might not be able to be here. Um, that that's why it's uh, why it's set up that way. But uh, we're so excited to welcome Jennifer Linda back. And we should say, you know, we've been putting more content on YouTube because of uh, when are we switched to Acast. They have a uh, the ability to you for you to kind of automatically load some of the shows. Some aren't working and I have to manually load. That's a different conversation <laughs> for an IT call down the line. But because our YouTube channel has been a little bit more active, we have decided, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to roll some cameras on some spe special shows. What that means is, no, I'm not firing up a camera right now. Uh, we beginning, uh, the first one is going to be on um, Friday, March 11th, 4 p.m. Pacific. This is tentative, big pencil markings here. Uh, but March 11th, Friday, we're going to do a live hour uh, Q&A type show uh, here on our YouTube channel. So subscribe if you haven't already. That way you can interact with us in real time, live, if you're watching live or a little bit later. It's going to be fun. We're going to be looking to do those once a month or so so we can uh, kind of interact with all of you on that side there. So there you go. Some big updates, you know? Yeah. Jennifer Land is coming back. We're going to have uh, plenty of room for all of the uh, listener questions. And we're going to put our faces on YouTube every once in a while. Every once in a while, yeah. I mean, I do it other spots, and you do it other spots. We just always say, I, mean, I, I hate to sound like we're stubborn over it, but like Force Center is an audio experience, and we approach it, and, and it's just, I cameras change the game a little bit. But uh, this is not going to be us going deep into, you know, the heart of Pong Krell and what's wrong with it. This is going to be fun hangout. Maybe some friends will pop on from time to time. We don't know. Uh, but chance to uh, just kind of uh, talk to you all in a different medium. So there you go. But the big news Jennifer Landa back on Monday news show starting March, uh, Tuesday, March 1st. We record on Mondays, released on Tuesday. I'll get it right one of these days. <laughs> well, that's it, Ken. Great episode. Great episode. Great episode. All right. Let's get into some Star Wars news. And yes, uh, we are uh, catching up on some of these stories that broke over the last week. So apologize if we miss all of the stories. Uh, we'll get to some things uh, down the line if we need to. Uh, but this big headline, Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's right. The show is on the way. And Obi-Wan is going to get his own theme by John Williams himself. Variety confirmed what was uh, kind of uh, in the rumor winds that 45 years after the world first heard John Williams' Star Wars score, the maestro is returning to record this theme for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Williams has composed and recorded an Obi-Wan Kenobi theme for the upcoming show. A composer has not been named for the series, or at least we don't know the name at this point point in time. Joseph, with that out, this is exciting news indeed. What are our thoughts and what thoughts come to mind when you think of John Williams scoring an Obi-Wan Kenobi theme for a show in 2022? Uh, to uh, quote Palpatine, but make it more uh, positive, a surprise to be sure, but a great one. Paraphrasing Palpatine. Uh, that's a new podcast we're also adding. Paraphrasing Palpatine. Uh, I am joking. We are not doing that yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is this was thrilling news. This is great news. And I miss the rumors, uh, which is sometimes nice to miss the rumors because this was yeah. brand new uh, to me. And uh, there's so many things I love about it, Ken. I, I think mm -hmm. there's the very full circle nature to it, right? Since um, what became known as the Force theme or Binary Sunset uh, mm -hmm. was originally intended to be Obi-Wan's theme. That's a thing that people yeah. talk about a lot. So this idea that, you know, this has been a fun anecdote for John Williams to talk about. It's like, yeah, I kind of meant that as Obi-Wan's theme, but then it became this much larger and totally different thing for him to be like, you know what's been bothering me for decades? <laughs> what is Obi-Wan's theme specifically then, right? <laughs> um, so I love that full circle nature. And um, I haven't seen any statements from from Williams himself, um, but it's really interesting to see uh, what compels him to return, right? Yeah. Uh, he talked a lot publicly about how his connection to the sequel trilogy and wanting to do them all was Ray. Yeah. That he was really moved by Daisy Ridley's performance and really wanted to help uh, continue and finish telling the story of Ray through music and his contribution. Then it's kind of amazing that he came back for Solo, right? For a character yeah. that he knew well and it worked so well for me in that score, which I love that he wrote the theme, which is then of course pops up throughout, but then John Powell did such an amazing job. So yeah. to have him come back for Obi-Wan feels like uh, I'm sure that he, he is invested in that character and that idea. And mm. what, how does Obi-Wan exist in the, uh, in the realm of music in John Williams mind must be something that engages him or he wouldn't yeah. be coming back. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that. 90 years young, uh, still working, still going on tour, still uh, wanting to come back. Uh, and, and and it just seems right. And, you know, I, I love the music of Boba Fett, love the music of, music of Mando, love that kind of that musical universe that's being built. But Kenobi, man, I mean, you're right. The Force theme was kind of his theme. Who hasn't hummed that tune every now and then? So I just, it just feels right. And I feel just blessed as a fan. But again, in 2022, a show with Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi is coming and John Williams is not only around for it, he has actively rolled up his sleeves, got involved and made a theme for uh, one of these legacy characters. Uh, there ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. And I also feel like um, there, there's inevitably going to be conversation around Obi-Wan Kenobi, the, the television show that we've talked about, where there's certainly going to be uh, viewers, fans who say, oh, we're, we're tired of the repeat characters. It's too much mm -hmm. nostalgia. And it's a it's a fine debate and it's going to be a talking point and <laughs> there's nothing that can be done about that but i think for me this news is a reminder that this is different from uh, mm -hmm. the mandalorian or book of boba fett which was kind of trying to stake out this uh, new era in in mm -hmm. time of the you know shortly after the new republic and what's happening to the bounty hunters in the criminal world and what's the music for this more western uh you know in samurai focused uh story right mm -hmm. The fact that Williams is coming back for Kenobi to me reminds me that this is a different show. This is tied to the main Skywalker saga. It's not trying to be the bold new Star Wars like you've never seen it before. It's like a subset of the Skywalker saga. And to me, it's appropriate that John Williams is coming back for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you're right. And there's, you know, brace, brace for impact. Uh, the hot takes are common when that show pops up. And as they should, you know, I want people to have an opinion on Kenobi the show and Kenobi the character. So uh, I guess, yeah, if Star Wars has a nostalgia problem, uh, if John Williams is part of that, then I'm here for the problem, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's going to be good. And, and uh, I'm excited because, you know, is, is, is it, is it going to be a variation on the binary sunset? Is he like, well, let me take from that and build from that? Is this something brand new? I love how it worked with Solo. I think John Powell's score is uh, vastly over, uh, not over it, underrated. Use the right term, Ken. Um, but, it, and it just, uh, you know, the Hans theme just kind of uh, worked as, uh, seamlessly with that there. So um, I uh, I absolutely uh, am excited for this. Just excited and excited for this. I couldn't be more excited for the series now, or at least I think I can't be more excited and then do something like this and I just get the, the Star Wars nerd chills. Yeah, I mean, just just from this straightforward nerd perspective, uh, being like many people, a big fan of Obi Wan Kenobi for the vast, you know, majority of my life, uh, yeah. to have him have his his very own theme, and it's so fun to wonder what it's going to be. You know, pensive, wise, determined. You know, exciting but muted at the same time. Ah, I can't wait to hear it. Can't wait to hear it indeed. We're so close. We're so close. The series, of course, debuts March twenty, uh, excuse me, May twenty fifth. Uh, 45 years after, right? Um, but um, I can't wait to a little little tidbits uh, peek uh, peek around the corner with the trailer and 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 whatnot. So marketing, marketing, marketing. I'm excited for marketing. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Hey, staying in the uh, musical side of things, uh, the Andor series grabs an Oscar-nominated composer. Reads the headline: FilmMusicReporter.com. Uh, is saying that uh, Nicholas Brittell has joined the Endor strike team, if you will. I said that, not them. Bad play of words by me, not them. Brittell is a multiple-timed Oscar nominee, most known for If Beale Street Could Talk, Moonlight, and I would say currently HBO's Succession uh, is, uh, you know, his theme there turned a lot of heads. A lot of people love that show. So general thoughts here, Joseph. Uh, what do we think Bertel can bring to Andor? This is a post John Williams world in a lot of ways. We kind of that impact with Ludwig coming up from Mando. We already kind of, uh, you know, dealt and got past and enjoyed that. So what's your thoughts here? Oh, this is thrilling news. I think this for me, uh, particularly combined with, uh, the announcement of John Williams writing an Obi-Wan Kenobi theme is this reminder that we're getting towards this, uh, buffet of different kinds of star Wars, uh, in, uh, certainly right, on Disney right. Plus and eventually on screen, I'm sure as well, because this feels totally appropriate to me that like Obi-Wan Kenobi is a legacy character. Vader's going to be in it. This is, you know, mm -hmm. it, the Kenobi show in some ways is going to be the Star Wars that we know, right? But yeah. then I think Andor is going to be something different because from everything we know from the descriptions, 
what we know of mm-hmm. uh, Andor's uh, job at this point in time, what we know from uh, the the resume of the writers. I really think this is going to be space espionage. This is going to be uh, gritty, you know, and to look at this composer who has mm. such a variety in his resume, like there's definitely some stuff in here that's probably a little bit more traditionally orchestral, like uh, Cruella. I'm, you know, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure that's a little bit more uh, orchestral, but like things like the big short and succession mm-hmm. are very modern and very, uh, you know, sparse and tense and emotional and it makes me think like this is going to be an entirely different style of music mm-hmm. uh, that really is there to accentuate. Yep. It's still star Wars, but there's a different mood because it's, it's a different show. It's a different dish uh, that you can scoop out of the star Wars buffet. Yeah. We love that buffet. I need some tacos right now. Anyways. Uh, and you saw, and looking at his credits, trying to pull, you know, that, um, the article list of here's the things he's known for. He, he all over the place in, a, in, a, in the best ways possible with what he worked on and hear me out here. When I, my first thought, yes, he's got this big HBO theme that everyone's uh, vibing on right now. A lot of people again, mm-hmm. love that show. Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, show, yeah. So, um, you know, but if Beale Street could talk moonlight, I, 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 and Oscars, right. I'm just, I think of, uh, I think of big movies and, and, I so love the Mando and Boba Fett scores. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, Ludwig Gornson just in and out of Star Wars too. I've, I've talked before about some of the other music he's produced that I love. I just, when I see this, I think, I think Andor is going to have a different feel. At least maybe I'm super hopeful that it's not, it's, uh, you know, nothing against the Boba Fett or Mando stuff, but like filmed on location, filmed over in England, a different vibe, different feel, and, and kind of getting a weekly movie feel, which I still think Mando Boba Fett have their own feel, but not a big giant movie feel to me. That's me. That's my take. Uh, and so when you get kind of a big score, uh, you know, composer like this to come on and do uh, do that kind of stuff, I don't know. It just it just makes me think that this show is going to be bigger in scope than I think people are giving it credit for. Yeah, it, it makes me think because of his his resume that there's absolutely the possibility of these moments where it is what we think of as as Star Wars music, where it's you know uh, swelling and operatic and you know huge, right? Where like everybody get out of the way because the music's coming, you know. <laughs> but then also where there's moments where it could be much more tense and stylized and less wall to wall scoring and themes yeah, yeah. and more just sparse and you know uh, a lot of these these dramas that he's written for are just they they are rich with tension, and tension. I think that makes a ton of sense. Uh, for something that's going to be dealing with espionage. Yeah, I mean, it's from the from the get-go, that all that's lined up from the description of the show, the people involved in the show, and now the music of the show. Tension. I love that word. Star yeah. Wars needs some good tension there. Love that. So uh, we'll update you uh, on more Andor stuff as we race towards Andor. Even the article from Phil, a music reporter, kind of was saying ahead of kind of that, uh, you know, third quarter kind of target area for release, right? Which I'm like... That's really close. If that's it, really that's, is. Uh, final news story here is uh, a new book on the way. A new book. We talked about small books like this one in my hand now. Uh, a new book on the way that tracks the Star Wars story through the ages. I bet this is going to be a big book. Uh, <laughs> get ready to put Star Wars timelines on your coffee table if you have room with your Razor Crest, Jabba, <laughs> Sail Barge. <laughs> Death Star Lego set. The authors of, of this uh, book are Kristen Baver, Jason Fry, Cole Horton, Amy Richow, and former ABC reporter Clayton Sandow's making his Star Wars writing debut. Great guy out there. Yeah. Uh, always a great positive presence. Good to see him joining this team. This book, as uh, as it's described, is a guide. It's not, a, it's not just a research. It's a guide. It's going to take you through all the Star Wars stories from the High Republic to the fall of the Final Order. It covers movies, shows, books, games, and more. Um, which of course means the first thing, my first thought, Joseph, is we're going to need volume two at some point. <laughs> yeah, look at I think it comes out in November, right? So it's like how much of Kenobi is in there, how much of Andor or is like, yeah. In so, what year will the second edition come out? Because it's coming. I, yeah, no, and I, which by the way, I love because I mean, Star Wars still goes on. So we yeah. look, we, no secret here, we love themes and emotional canon and discussing what's in the stories for us. But make no mistake. Me, Joseph, and Jennifer, all of us, and all of you listening. We also love canon. That's why we're here, too. We do love knowing all the things where they fit fit in. Uh, So what do we feel about getting an official timeline book, Joseph? Yeah, a couple of things. I think, um, for me, I 
I really like it because I think it does lead into the emotional canon. I think yeah. laying things out in like sequential order, I think sometimes can help us as fans step back from looking at an individual movie and, you know, what, what parts did we like? What parts did we didn't? Did this make sense? Did that make sense? And just seeing it on a, on a piece of paper and mm-hmm. say, here's what happened to Anakin. Now, years later, here's what happened to Luke, what happened to Rey. And before that, here's what, what happened to this uh, Jedi in the High Republic. And that, um, those emotional cannons start to pop because that's really all mm-hmm. you're looking at, right? Is, yeah. is how uh, we, we poke fun as a community at George Lucas's. It's poetry. It, it's like poetry. It rhymes, but that is so much the power of Star Wars storytelling. It is a generational tale where uh, different uh, eras and ages uh, deal with some of the same problems and try to find a way forward and try to learn from the past, but not repeat those mistakes. And I think all those great themes and, and this great uh, uh, term that you coined of emotional canon kind of pop off the page when it's just all lined up there. It really does. There's something comforting about seeing it, seeing the connections. Even uh, Kristen Baver in announcing this and talking about this on StarWars.com is like, you know, in researching uh, her Skywalker Family at War book, a, a book we reviewed here and enjoyed on Force Center, just to see all the stories. And when you lay it down and there's in this modern era where, with the comics and like I said, even the games, like I forget even that tablet game I played on my iPad in 2014 is canon. So, to speak, you know, there's characters that pop up every now and then. And it's like, to maybe put it all in there, uh, it is just fun. But you're also right. It, that's when the things we do talk about start to really emerge. And that's part of the fun, I think, as well. I've always described me watching things like Star Wars, uh, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, whatever, these big fandom stories, Um a living history document where I just like, Oh, I find out what's next or find out what that blank when we fill it in, like what that was. And I just kind of love that. But I think it even means more now, believe it or not. I think it means more now when you see the heart of it all and how it connects. So I think good point on that, Josh. Yeah. And I think some things that right now fans kind of have to pull together and, you know, is always huge. Uh, A tip of the hat to Alex and Molly Damon to do such a great, job at Star Wars Explained, kind of pulling some of these things together. But, you know, imagine if there is just like a little uh, breakout box that's like, here are all the known Jedi who were alive <laughs> during the Imperial era, right? And just seeing that on the page, I think uh, it, it it opens up the story to people, uh, to fans who maybe don't have the time to do a podcast <laughs> yeah. or, you know, watch a thousand YouTube videos, uh, especially younger fans. I think it opens it up to younger fans where like, you don't have to do all of the work to cross compile <laughs> across decades of movies, TV shows, books, video games. It can just be there on the page and it, it lets you engage with the story because you don't have to do as much work to pull it all together. Yeah. Look, and shout out to Alex and Molly every year. Alex does the, um, does the the updated canon timeline video and i watch every second of it because uh where does the new where do the new things fall in so yep. it's not, it's not easy for alex and molly put that together but um editing a youtube video versus an entire second edition, edition of the book gonna be an interesting thing <laughs> that they do with acolyte ahsoka um the thrawn show that's not coming i'm just i'm just saying it. I'm just <laughs> anyways but it's a fun challenge and it's just part of the fun of being a star wars fan all this stuff is what makes me a Star Wars fan uh, to this this degree so much fun and so rewarding? You can spend an afternoon just looking at the Star Wars time, timeline. Love yeah, I, a, a couple other quick thoughts here, mm-hmm. and I, I'm very curious about yours. I, the the image on the cover is really engaging to me because there are many images from you know the famous films, but there mm-hmm. are a ton of more modern images. Right? There's mm-hmm. a lot of images from the sequels. Uh, there's from Solo, from Rogue One. Uh, from the Disney Plus shows, from Rebels, from the High Republic. Do you, just looking at that cover, do you feel like a, a part of this from a, a marketing or, or welcoming into Star Wars perspective is, hey, if you're younger in particular uh, mm-hmm. and you got hooked on Rebels or you really like, uh, you know, The Mandalorian, but you're not immersed, here, here's a book that will help you figure out what's going on. I think you have to consider that in these quote modern times and stuff. Yeah, I think you do. And I love that. I'd, I would love to hear more about someone's relationship to, oh my gosh, I love those High Republic novels. Not that, hey, what's this other stuff? But like, yeah, I know there's other stuff. Clearly, you know, there's other stuff. Um, but if this can pull you in and this can be that kind of resource to to show it all to you, make it all important. I think it's very, I'm looking at the cover right now. You're right. It's It's very balanced. 
very balanced across uh, all uh, eras and uh, mediums of Star Wars. And I think you, you need to, because that's where we're at. There's so much Star Wars. That's the buffet. Joseph, this is the buffet menu. <laughs> the, the, I could just eat that cover up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One of the other things I'm really intrigued by is this description that from the time before the High Republic to blah, blah, blah. Um, what do you want out of knowledge about uh, mm-hmm. the time before the High Republic? Are you expecting any news to be <laughs> broken in a book like this? Or do you think, feel like the little scraps that we have uh, uh, in modern canon about what exactly has been said about Jedi, Sith conflict, Mandalorian wars, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Are, you, are you expecting to just find those breadcrumbs laid out? I would, I would love to, you know, announce the High Republic show, not High, the old Republic show that uh, we all think that they for years have been making, right? Like this is it, page one, <laughs> coming this fall, Disney Plus. No, but you know, you take the Tar uh, Tar Vizsla stuff and and you know some of the the Revens and the the Banes and the Malguses and all these characters and names uh, out there. Um, you know, I mean, we haven't even talked about the the the, the cinematic uh, trailer that was uh, released last week for the Old Republic uh, Legacy of the Sith stuff. Yeah, um, co-written by uh, our buddy Alex Backus and, and his writing partner Josh Callahan, who's an old fantasy baseball buddy of mine. I knew him before I knew any of you, uh, which is a weird life goes that way. Uh, you know, it, it focuses on Malgus and people love that stuff and 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 are craving more of that in um, Star Wars modern canon. So maybe this is a chance to really kind of those breadcrumbs put them down and then maybe we'll pick them up a little bit later yeah yeah so i am very intrigued by what all they're going to cover there my Mm -hmm. other question i want to ask you ken is um how do you feel about events being locked down to a date like this has timeline so it could Mm -hmm. just be like and then further down the line (laughs) this happens or it could get into here's our new uh structure right for how we delineate time in Star Wars, whatever system they use, because uh, there have been so many. But like right now, the Mandoverse has avoided being pinpointed, right? Like yeah, yeah. it's just been in, I think, interviews and press releases. It's five, seven. It's kind of after the <laughs> relatively recently after Return of the Jedi. Don't worry about it. And and yeah. I sort of perceive a desire, at least from, and this is my opinion, uh, uh, from Favreau of like, let's not worry about that. Let's not pin it down too much. Mm-hmm. I, it would seem like this book might go like, yes, it has been <laughs> 387 days since blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no. And, and, and even looking at the design, right, clearly it looks like the, the, those lines, those different colored lines are probably this, the timelines right there, right? Uh, I'm interested to see how they how they make that all work. I, 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 I think it's a mix. I would love to know the exact moment of you know the day the the galactic concordance was signed and and the war truly ended right yeah or whatever yeah i would love to know a little bit more of that some of it is there already to be clear um but i still i do like erring on the side of giving it all space yeah so it's just kind of a general year but you know, looking at Mando, there's, there's, I mean, even Book of Boba Fett, when they crossed over and they had the, the, the moments, you know, from uh, season one, chapter five of Mando now play out in, in Book of Boba Fett from a different point of view. Even then the lighting, the, the moon, the sun, the stars seemed, people had questions. Well, when did that actually happen? We had a great question, but how long did it, did it happen? And, and I don't know if we'll get down to that nitty gritty, but uh, yeah, it won't take the magic away from me. If, if, you know, Mando chapter one is, you know, Five years, 14 days, 12 hours after the fall of, you know, the, the, the second Death Star explodes. Uh, it won't take the fun away from me, um, but, uh, you know, I don't need it as much as I used to. Just want to know the general time. Yeah, I think I, I'm I'm with you there. I feel like a compulsion as a fan to want to know the <laughs> the yeah. dates, right? And know like, okay, exactly. So what's what else is going on with uh, this other character while everything in Book of Boba Fett is happening, right? Yeah. Um, but then also, like, I also want to approach a book like this as... Uh, this book in the real world is written by all this great team of people, but in the imaginary world of Star Wars, is this the best timeline that historians could could uh, lay down? And there's still that e- energy of myth of like, yeah. well, this is what one historian believes, but maybe in future storytelling we'll realize, oh, what we thought actually happened five years after Return of the Jedi actually happened seven yeah. because storytelling demands it. Yeah, don't go into a movie theater with this book. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? Are you having popcorn? No, I've got to pull this book out. I got to make sure I know. Um, but again, I, I have fun. I, I like to know. I like it because sometimes, um, in a, in a good way, I mean this. It gets confusing, 
right? Well, okay, the, that Vader comic issue one, they did that. They and but Luke has Yoda's lightsaber. Okay, when did you know? I I love finding out those answers, and sometimes it does come in the form of specific dates. You also asked about like the timeline. You know, we grew up just being so used to Yavin, the Battle of Yavin being kind of this, you know, year zero. So it's either yeah. before or after. They they've changed that, and there's been new, you know, new new ways. I I I I I wouldn't mind if everything kind of has uh has the new timeline, but yeah, I don't need that, you know. Yeah, that will be fascinating. I'm looking forward to this one. It's gonna. Oh, this is right up my alley. You guys know I love those big uh, coffee table research books. Uh, so I'll have to get another coffee table. That's clear. <laughs> uh, but I have until November because that is when this book is coming out from DK. All right, uh, we've looked at the Star Wars news for now. We're going to take a quick break and get to your questions. But before we do that, we have an audiobook we'd like to recommend to you. Joseph, what do we have? We have The Midnight Horizon by Daniel Jose Older. The next adventure in the High Republic book. The events in this book are probably marked down in Star Wars timelines. And we'll be able to read about that. But first, uh, we're going to discuss this book and you can listen to it uh, on Audible if you'd like. Yeah, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash force center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audiobook. All right, let's take a break and then get to your questions here on Force Center. Welcome back to Force Center, the big show, the main show, the superstar destroyer of our fleet. But the fleet, as we said up top, is growing. More ships <laughs> have come on in here. So uh, uh, we are uh, here to answer your questions. Joseph, uh, you've pulled some wonderful questions from Twitter and Patreon. What do we got? Yeah, we go first to our two questions from Twitter, and then we'll move on to Patreon. So first up is Bradley Tussing. Bradley says... I wanted to let you know how much your positive attitude really stands out and is appreciated in what can be a toxic environment at times. Uh, thank you, Bradley. That's very kind. And Bradley uh, heads into a question and says, if you can only get one, which would you rather see? Solo 2 in a theater or a Crimson Dawn series with a sporadic Alden Ehrenreich as Han? <laughs> <laughs> Sporadic Alden Ehrenreich sounds like this uh, great like uh, action figure that you have of Alden Ehrenreich in different styles and poses. Do yeah. you collect sporadic Alden Ehrenreich? Uh, yes. Great, great question. A torturous question having to choose. Uh, where do you go, Ken? Yeah, it's funny. Normally, a question like like this would you know be I'd be like, well, great, we don't have to choose. Well, no, this is a fun question, Bradley, because who knows? This could be something that uh, a choice has been made. Maybe the choice has already been made. Uh, follow me for hot scoops. Uh, I have none, by the way, folks. Uh, Solo two in a theater, Crimson Dawn series. I am going with Crimson Dawn series, Joseph. Yes, uh, I, I initially resisted choosing as well, but I want to <laughs> play yeah. along with the the wonderful spirit of Bradley's question, and also this one is is a little bit more of a yeah the a business marketing yeah. choice is definitely going to go into this one. I would I I definitely want to see more uh, of Han as uh, Han as Alden Ehrenreich, Alden Ehrenreich <laughs> as Han, uh, and I would love to see Solo two in a theater. I wish that it had just crushed the box office and we're already seen yeah, yeah. <laughs> a solo too. Um, I think there would be, uh, I don't think it's likely uh, because mm-hmm. of how solo performed in the, in at the box office, which was quite well, but not as <laughs> yeah. amazing as uh, people want for a star Wars film. But I think there might be a lot of resistance to that. And then also for me, just in terms of the story I want to see, I would love to see Han and Chewie go pick up exactly where we left off, right? And there, that mm. first encounter where Han is awkwardly knocking on the door of the palace, going, "I heard about a gig." <laughs> <laughs> I want to see every second of that, you know, uh, in whatever adventure they have. But I'm I'm more compelled by the Crimson Dawn thing because it feels to me uh, a little bit more new. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it'd be great as a series. I, I've been. Uh, half serious, half joking about the title, but Crimson Dawn colon Kira versus Maul. Hmm. I've been talking about wanting that since Solo came out. I think it's one of the most compelling sort of cliffhangers of the Solo film of how does Kira thread this needle? 100%. And, and you know, the, the Kira back in the comics, the Crimson Rain, uh, Crimson Rain comic is uh, probably already an issue or two behind, but it's begun. Great stuff. And they were just proving there's a, 
there's a desire for more Kira content and more Crimson Dawn related content. I don't think, I don't know if people are rooting for a criminal organization uh, content, but, but maybe, but again, it's what Kira does with it. The restructuring of Crimson Dawn, um, uh, what she does during that time, what's the relationship to the empire, especially then. And yeah, the main event to me is absolutely Maul versus Kira. Hear me out here. It's almost like we don't even need Han and Chewie. And I, I, I'm, 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 I mean, it's weird for me to even say that because I too want to see all right, like uh, and you know Swatamo uh, working again as Han and Chewie. So it's almost like it, it, you know when I think of Crimson Dawn and Kira and, and Maul, I, I just I don't think about Han and Chewie a lot. I think them off going off and doing their adventures, and I almost don't want them to interact again. Um, but uh, but I'll see. But yeah, yeah, I think. But that's just that's not a any slight on on Han and Chewie of that era. It's just a, a testament to the potential of storytelling around Crimson Dawn and Kira. Yeah, I mean, I guess my honest answer is like, yeah, if there was any way possible, I would, I would want both. But if I had to choose uh, a lightsaber ignited in front of me, <laughs> yeah, who's now? Uh, it would be the Crimson Dawn. I think partially uh, because uh, Amelia Clark, I think, is just, I think her performance as Kira is great. I think Kira is such a unique and interesting character in, in general, but also in Star Wars of somebody who has this uh, perspective that you could call cynical, but when you look through her life experiences, you totally understand why she would have this perspective of yeah. everybody serves somebody. And hey, I I managed to both uh, keep my old friend Han from getting into more trouble than he realizes. And also I climbed up one rung of the ladder. Yeah. Now there's this being that I'm understandably terrified of, but if my life philosophy is everybody serves somebody, is there any way I can get rid of him so I don't have to serve him anymore? Uh, that's that's such a fascinating story to me of how her, and I, I know there's a stuff in the comics, I'm not entirely caught up on that, but I still think there's room before the comics for in specific taking off right from Solo and how does, how does she uh, free herself on some level from Maul? Yeah, I mean, I, the series, this fantasy series we're writing here, like, begins with her taking a deep breath, going, all right, now I have to go address everyone at the party. <laughs> Dryden's dead. <laughs> Amon, oh, can you come yes. in here? You know, Amon's uh, probably in a, in a world of heart, too. But, you know, yeah, like, yeah, that, that, pick it up right from there. Yeah, no, Tote Ra, I've got bad news from you about all your Hyloban <laughs> friends. Yeah. Can uh, Lolito Prima come in here? I need a special <laughs> song for him to sing. <laughs> Yeah, can you? I, you really need to sing really loudly while we get rid of uh, this body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. ejected in hyperspace. Uh, yeah, and I think um, I, you know the mall story is still unfolding, and I, I that this probably wouldn't be the story, but I still like the head cannon that. Kira figured out a way to dump Maul on Molokor, and that's why he's <laughs> stranded there in Rebels. Well, yeah, and and how and 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 sharding his life and and his. Uh, his whole, uh, you know, thematic, uh, you know, you know, storyline, uh, thematic based storyline of you know pushing the, the rock up and the rock keeps falling down. That Freddie Prince Jr. <laughs> talked about so on that Dick viral clip a couple years ago. Like, what got him that point? Is he is he broken, defeated? Is it was it Kira directly at a at a feat of uh, you know physical strength? Was it a mastermind thing, or uh, did what she started to do to you know break him down even more? You know, and and, and I don't want to take it away from Kira's victory. You know, you know what I mean, but just like. It's interesting to track not just the the how, how but the why of of how did what went wrong with you, Ball? Yeah, how did you end up there uh, alone yeah. with a in a <laughs> yeah. with a cane waiting for some uh, some youngins to manipulate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Any other thoughts on this one? Uh, no, uh, other than we need it. Let's do it. Yeah, a lot of fun headcanon uh, there for us. Thank you for the great question, Bradley. We're going to move on to a question from James. I'm going to take a run at pronouncing your last name, and I apologize uh, if I get it incorrectly. Uh, Pasqual Pasqualucci? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, apologies if I got that wrong. Here we go. Moving on to James' question. Hello there, Ken and Joseph. This is my first question, but before that, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you do as wonderful students of Star Wars. I've listened to you both for a while now, and your amazing insights and deep dives only continue to enhance my love of this modern era. That's very kind, very much appreciated. Uh, James says, on to my question. My favorite place in Star Wars is the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Mm. I love it as the symbol of the Jedi that stood for so long before Palpatine claimed it as his own. Do you think we could see more storytelling from it in the future? 
I would love to see it post episode nine. I would love to see Ray visit it. I would love to see the Jedi Order use it again in some way. Do you think there is a thematic or important storytelling possibility to my surface level ideas? What would you like to see? Thanks to you both. I don't think this is surface level at all. I think whenever the Jedi Temple uh, pops Mm. up or the Imperial Palace in Palpatine's era, it is rich with meaning and storytelling possibility. So I would love this. Where do your thoughts go first, Ken? Yeah, no, I love this indeed. And and this James is a great thought here. And and it is this wonderful symbol. I love when it shows up. I I love when we get more storytelling. I love roaming around it in a video game. (laughs) You know, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do think it represents that, you know, cycle of change clearly. And I also think a little bit of that Star Wars stuff, uh, you and I love Joseph, of, of taking old, combining it with the new of just like this old temple, new regime, uh, new regime and an old temple, just back and forth. And I don't necessarily think I need the temple to be some sort of, uh, you know, like go with me, like a Jerusalem with crusaders fighting for it over and over mm. for generations. But that said, I d- I like the idea idea of the Jedi going back there. I like the idea of them reclaiming it. And to James' point, specifically I, the idea of kind of this ray from nowhere, meaning I don't mean, you know, let, that's a, now a controversial statement, but just like, you know, cast aside, out of the story, climbs the hills to get back into it, thinks Jedi are the myth. Uh, and then, you know, Octo was one thing, but to go to the temple, the, 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 the beacon of the Jedi Order for so many generations, for her to go there, to find herself in that story, even if it's just a, I don't know, a Netflix documentary of Ray walking around going, Oh, and here's this. And here's this, (laughs) like, give me a tour. I don't care. But just to see her in that environment and just the big scope of, of the Jedi order. And and, and again, she'll have some thoughts of maybe some of it didn't work. Maybe some of it wasn't needed. I got some books saying one thing and a person telling me the other or life experiences, you know, there's big questions to have around it, but I think it'd be fun to see her interact with that. That said, I would love to see some Luke content, Mm-hmm. Him, him doing the same thing after episode six. I mean, that would be a place of darkness, perhaps a trauma and a challenge to him, but also him trying to, he's clearly in a, I've got to rebuild the order and building his old school is a little different than moving into the temple. I don't, I don't, I agree with that. I, I, I like the, the, the new school where it is, but just that's, that's, that's interesting to me too. Just Luke walking around the halls. What, what ghosts are there for him to discover? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest question about it moving forward is what what ghosts are there? What does it mean to the characters and what does it mean to the idea of rebuilding the Jedi? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also think it's just totally tied into Coruscant because we don't know a lot about Coruscant, right? Of like, yeah. um, there's the thought from the books that the New Republic wants to move uh, the, the home world of the government uh, around from mm-hmm. time to time. They want to have uh, something fresh and new instead of, uh, Coruscant, but it, that leaves this great big question open of like, is Coruscant still like a really central uh, place in the galaxy? It is in the literal center. It's a, the, the whole planet's one big city. Uh, so millions, billions of beings live there. But what's the vibe now that it, it's not the center of power from either the Republic or the Jedi, you know? Yeah, like, is did New York City now become the second city? That's Chicago, man, not New York. Yeah, yeah what are we? Yeah, no, <laughs> is it the uh, Windy Planet? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the general Coruscant conditions, that's mm-hmm. really fascinating uh, it, that the Jedi Temple is tied to that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the Jedi Temple is just one of my favorite places. It's one of the reasons that in True. 2002 when other people had, you know, nothing uh, but mean things to say about Attack of the Clones, it's like, I don't care. I saw a library. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jedi Temple, you know, like. Uh, th- this this uh, descriptions and books of you know other other rooms and places and in the Clone Wars getting to see it more it's just it's fascinating to me I'm such a Jedi fan and that this is the the Jedi's home a sacred place their secret base <laughs> where they park their ships their library it's everything right and to have it be and then it's in the middle of a bustling metropolis which also gets you know um, examined in like Master and Apprentice I think it's where Qui Gon's thinking like. We should be out in the galaxy more. It may, maybe shouldn't be sitting just in this uh, urban environment in the center of the galaxy that we should mm-hmm. be seeing a lot more perspectives. And maybe it was a mistake to hole up there. Um, it, yeah. it, it's so rich in storytelling ideas just by itself. Oh, yeah. That idea of, you know, they're almost uh, downright cosmopolitan, baby. Like they're there. They're in there. They're there in the center of it all. Uh, and I both like that and agree that, you know, it makes sense that uh, I think you've seen in the High Republic so many Jedi out and about. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and having a different perspective because, like, yeah, no, we we are out where the problems are. You're talking about the problems in theory while going to uh, you know fancy operas at night. <laughs> Heading <laughs> you know? down to Texas, yeah. Heading down to Texas. I have a. Uh, I'm going to keep the uh, speculation responsible for myself. Whereas, where if it doesn't pan out, I will let it go. But one of the bits of concept art that they released in that Kenobi sizzle reel looks a little like stormtroopers in the Jedi temple now Imperial palace. So I do have a tiny bit of hope that we could see it fully as the Imperial palace on screen in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Cause we've seen it in the comics a lot with all the Vader comics and, you know, various uh, times where Palpatine is being mean to Darth Vader <laughs> yep. in the old uh, Jedi council chambers. And poor Vader has to be like, I remember the first time I walked in here and people were mean to me. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. Look, I, I still, yeah, uh, may uh, love making this joke, but it should, Madonna's. This used to be our playground. Should be playing as Kenobi goes down these hallways. <laughs> it just works for me. Yeah, so I would love to see that story on screen of the you know somebody who that place was sacred to, like Obi Wan. Obviously, he had to go mm-hmm. through it when after the the tragedy. But seeing just stormtroopers and imperial business, you know, mm-hmm. um, so that would be great. And then I totally agree with you, just with uh, Luke and Ray. I think we'll get those stories someday. Um, and they're so rich. I, I have to think it's high up on Luke's list. You know, in yes. Shattered Empire, we get the great, like, okay, I have to go rescue this tree because I know it's in danger now. Like, mm-hmm. he's like, so, I love that he's, I'm Luke Skywalker, a Jedi Knight and uh, an artifact preservationist immediately, right? Immediately, yeah. Uh, and I think there's a great story to be told, and I can't remember if it's in anything, but, like, when one regime falls, it often, uh, you know, burns uh, mm-hmm. the historical artifacts in the places on the way out, right? So yeah. did Masamito or some stormtroopers try to light that temple up right. on the way out? Uh, so I have to think that it would be a priority for Luke to go there. And mm-hmm. just all the emotions for Luke to be like, okay, kind of, re- I kind of reconnected to my father, but now I'm, I'm, I can physically visit his room where he grew up, right? And this is the order that I'm tasked with restoring, uh, but also the knowledge that it's been you know, utterly violated by Palpatine. And and does Luke go, I want to understand the true story, so I'm going to visit the ancient Sith temple underneath, you know? Right, right, all the way to the core. And, you know, if I was uh, if I was uh, Palpatine and his team, I'd just, re- you know, re- replay footage of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the younglings being destroyed as, as Vader's biggest victory. Now I know Vader's <laughs> secret identity. You don't want to blow that. I know, I know. Go with me here. But you know what I mean? Like, Luke's got to revisit all that there. There could be a spot. spot yeah. Yeah, and, and there's room, I think, for, uh, you know, depending on how these stories were told, you, there there could be a great, you know, uh, book or one-shot comic that's, uh, you know, uh, the the mirror visits of Luke and Ray, depending on the the condition yeah. of the temple. Um, but for Ray, it's got this great uh, weight because it is her connecting with, uh, you know, uh, the Jedi of the past, which is something she's clearly invested in. Um, but it's also, the, that was the seat of her grandfather's power as well. Yeah. So that's... Uh, you know, I think meaningful for her who has gone through this journey of, am I, you know, am I defined by, uh, you know, this blood and, and uh, rejecting that and saying no. And it's interesting for her to have then have to visit the history. This was the Jedi temple forever, but there's a Sith uh, temple beneath it. You know, does that make her think of her journey on Octo or like, yeah, any place where there's great light, there's also going to be great darkness. And that's reality. Yeah. Love the idea of her exploring that. I just love, of course, in general, this is a question specifically about the Jedi Temple, but I always talk about those shots of Rogue One where it's just like, I love kind of seeing that big, this is a big prequel set. This is a big location in the prequels in modern Star Wars time, how it's shot. Even even the flashback with um, Grogu and Book of Boba Fett, just seeing those hallways again. Uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that. And so, yeah, any kind of way, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it's been discussed a lot of real world reasons why maybe Coruscant was in, wasn't in seven or eight or nine and how it almost was in nine, the battle of Coruscant, which was an idea I did like from that uh, alleged lost script. A lot of the others I didn't. Um, I, I, I would love to revisit Coruscant overall. And I, uh, you know, to, to, to not uh, erase it from star Wars at all, you know? Yeah. So what, if you had to guess, what is the Jedi temple uh, after the Imperial palace and the new Republic gets going? Is it a museum? <laughs> I was, is it I was, yeah. is it uh, luxury uh, condos? What do you think the Jedi Temple Imperial Palace is? <laughs> too real, too real, and a chain restaurant version of Dexter's Diner. He sold the chain. Um, I actually, all jokes aside, you know, some kind of a, a museum or honoring the Jedi, 
would be interesting. Now, now, yes, you know, do the Jedi themselves fade into myth again? You know, Rey on Jakku kind of has, you get that feeling, but she's on mm-hmm. Jakku. Um, another planet from the par- farthest from type of vibe over there. So I think in Corson it would definitely be different, especially if there's any type of, you know, just going to that Luke Skywalker Del Mico scene in Battlefront 2, that's, that was, Del Mico was someone raised on Coruscant and fed the lies that the Jedi destroyed it all. And they're the bad guys. And, and, you know, Luke kind of pointed that out to him. Hey, maybe you feared the wrong thing growing up there. People in Coruscant would have an opinion of that. And if that, and it's maybe they, you know, it being open for business, the Jedi orders being rebuilt and moving back in, maybe they would resist that, but maybe it's a place of learning, you know, Hey, here's what was erased by Palpatine. Yeah. I mean, I, there's fun real world implications of like, yeah. y- you know, is it like, you know, visiting some site that was, that has a complex history and is sacred and these mm-hmm. to some people and not to others. And like, it, it's mostly controlled by like preservations, preservationists yeah. and government and historical societies. And here's this, this, you, you can visit this room and we'll tell you all the theories. Allegedly there's some other temple beneath it. And some mm-hmm. people say Palpatine was this and, some people say the Jedi were this, but look around and decide and <laughs> yeah. and buy a t-shirt on the way out. <laughs> and buy a, I, I walked the Jedi temple. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 joking. And it is real world, but you, we just think of it in terms of story that that statue comes down at the end of the uh, return of the Jedi. And what happens the next morning? What do they do with that palace? What do they do with that temple? It's, it, it's very intriguing. Yeah. So James, great question. As you can tell, we are extremely excited by it. There's so much great storytelling that I think is like uh, the big kind of galactic story and the deeply personal to to some of our individual character stories. And Joseph, you got me really excited. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about the, that concept art from Kenobi and the possibility of him walking into the like the Jedi archives again or something. Oh, man, uh, you know, I might really want that. I got to let go of that right now in case it doesn't happen. Yeah, and I could be totally off base, but we could also see it in Kenobi or Andor in like it, it no big deal way because it's the Imperial Palace, right? We yeah. could just be like, that's where we if we're following a, an Imperial, mm-hmm. you know, doing day to day business, they might be in the Jedi Temple. Absolutely, Ugh, such great stuff. All right, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our other questions. Uh, these come to us from patrons on Patreon. This comes from Steve Nort. Uh, Steve says, "Hey, Joseph and Ken, with the book of Boba Fett fresh on everyone's minds and heavily." a part of water cooler Zoom talks these days at the old job, I often hear hot takes that get me a little defensive. (laughs) (laughs) I can usually brush it off and engage only when asked my opinion directly, being the Star Wars guy and all, but it does get under my skin from time to time. The finale was fun, but what was even the point of the first couple episodes with the Tusken Raiders? They had nothing to do with the story. I'm introducing my kid to Star Wars, but I'm just going to skip over the sequel trilogy because it was bad and made no sense. You can easily skip The Phantom Menace and not miss anything important. Just an example to name a few. Uh, All great examples uh, written by Steve that I have encountered as well, and I'm sure many listeners have. Uh, Steve uh, concludes, was wondering how you guys handle Star Wars conversation in day-to-day discourse without losing your cool and well actually people. (laughs) When do you feel it's okay to engage or offer clarity, and when is it better to just keep yourself on mute? Mm -hmm. Thanks. This is a really great question, and, and I think a, a really interesting thing uh, to explore, uh, really from the perspective, from lots of different perspectives. But Ken, I think the place that my mind goes right away is you and I doing this podcast. Almost anyone listening to this podcast are deeply engaged with Star Wars, so these mm-hmm. conversations are not necessarily casual to us, right? No, uh, yeah, and, and and that phrase Steve used that get me a little defensive. Um, <laughs> it's the understatement of the century for me. But here's where I go. Uh, his question is about the day to day discourse, yeah. maybe the in, in, in person stuff, or you know, people who know you. And I, I always say, and I've said before, and I'll say it again. Joseph is the Star Wars guy, and his kind of friend group going back to his days in Minnesota or high school, college. I'm I'm the Star Wars guy for old work. I still get texts from people. Hey, did you see this? And it's a Star Wars meme that's seven years old. I just go, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's it's a Death Star fire pit. Yep, yep, yep. Um, there's that kind of stuff. And I think all of us, I think if you come to a, if you're listening to a Star Wars podcast, you are probably the Star Wars person in your group. Um, so going to that, I, I just, I, I think I gauge in, what is the ability to engage or offer clarity and what is just, I need to smile because 
I'm not going to move them off their mountain and they're not pushing me off of mine. And <laughs> we all need to move on. <laughs> we all need to go enjoy lunch break without in peace. Uh, that's where I start, Just That's where I start. Yeah. No, I think uh, for me, uh, it's it's a challenge. There was one social event that I had last year that uh, as I was preparing for it, I actually practiced. Like I didn't set aside time, but like while I was brushing my teeth, I was like, this old friend of mine who I really like is probably going to say something like this to me. <laughs> and how am I going to keep it uh, friendly and, you know, not get defensive and not get, mm. get angry, you know? Um, and that, so that's definitely where I start of, I want to, uh, I, I well, let me say it this way. I think Steve uh, has, ha, has a lot right just in his question, right? Of I can mm-hmm. usually brush it off and engage only when asked my opinion directly, right? Yeah. So for me, there is that question of what is the context? And I so relate to what Steve is describing where it's like, the, the con- sometimes it comes up in the context where there's there's not room for discussion. It's like we're on the Zoom call for business and we're <laughs> waiting for the last person to join the call. <laughs> and then someone casually says a perfectly valid day to day Star Wars opinion. <laughs> and there's not room for me to go. That makes me viscerally angry. And let me explain to you why, you know, like there's there's just not there's not it's not a discussion. Somebody said a, a statement and mm. you just got to live with it. Right. Yeah, look, look, and, and, and this opens up a lot of areas. And I'm trying not to approach this question, this great question from from Steve uh, with current, you know, uh, Star Wars discourse online, something I, I choose to not be a part of. I just, I, that's not just about words muted. I just see, even if I see things, I'm like, that's just not where I need to, to put my energy. It's it, it's different, even in podcasts. You know, we tweet out a podcast. To me, that's a billboard. If you want to yell at the billboard, about our episode, that's fine too. Uh, maybe I'll engage my mind. What pulls me out is, is, is and, and 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 forces me to engage, even if I'm not asked, is is where I some of the stuff Steve's talking about. You can easily skip the Phantom Phantom Menace, not miss anything important. That's that's wrong to the Star Wars story. But I just I have to make sure if 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 I'm focused and I'm finding the light side, I have to remember first of all, go with me. None of this matters. <laughs> <laughs> meaning it's we're talking about a very important space franchise but it's also a silly space you know there's bigger things in the world to pl- plug into it but i get the, i get rolling up the sleeves but also uh, you know i i just i just uh, uh i i just think you got to leave some some room right for everyone to maybe take their own journey to it mm-hmm. uh and for us to have our own and I think some of the stuff that you and I discussed here uh, and Jennifer again soon and in the past, you know, it, it's, I don't know for, I always say we're not saying anything too deep. It's right there. I feel like I'm Leo DiCaprio on that meme pointing at the screen. It's right there. We're talking about a theme that's right there. The theme, the point, the communication is right there. And yes, it's things are up to interpretation and I think you need to leave room, but there's sometimes just like, no, 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 no. The, the Jedi at their heart are good. Things they've done might have been wrong, but that's what's that's in there. That's good. That's the story's there. Yeah. Uh, and and so and then when I think people seem, seem to speak for creators as if they know what know them <laughs> is what pulls me out of it and knocks me off. But when but again, if I'm doing this, doing this right, I need to leave everyone, including myself, to have room on the journey to change or grow and push forward or go now that version wasn't for me. You know what I mean? Just, just, and then that helps calm anything down and removes my defensiveness. Yeah. I, I really agree with that. I think I try to think about where the other person is coming from. Right. And they probably don't know, like they might know I have a star Wars podcast, but they probably don't understand how much that means to me. Right. That I get like a ton of joy and just spend a, a lot of my waking time studying, analyzing, thinking, discussing, so for them, it's like, eh, Star Wars is popular. I saw the new one. <laughs> yeah. Here's yeah. my strong opinion about it. And they don't realize that for me, it's like, it's just like you saw a picture of my dog and said my dog was ugly and then walked away like, hey, that actually like, that's something that means a lot to me. And that's not really cool that you just <laughs> said like, hey, we're beginning our Zoom meeting. Your dog looks dumb and probably urinates on the carpet. <laughs> anyway, like they don't understand that that's the way it feels to me because they don't understand yeah. my perspective. Yeah, 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 and, and this is this is a fun conversation because it's uh, it's it's even something I'm working through. It's 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 since uh, 2017. It's been a lot tougher to talk about stories online. And again, nothing, none of this matters. There's more important things in life to worry about than even as I say, it's been tough to talk Star Wars online. Okay, you know, go touch some grass, as they keep saying on the internet. <laughs> I keep saying this, that every week. Touch some grass. I do touch some grass. Uh, but I think I think it's I think it is a little bit of that too. You're right. Of like 
I, I told the story before here, but it's uh, applicable to uh, applicable. Excuse me to this um, conversation. Like I, I was getting a, a, a ride from like a Lyft driver, and he looks over and he sees my two uh, pins, my enamel pins from uh, my buddies at Black Series Rebels. It was Han and Leia, and he's like, "Is that Star Wars?" Yeah, and I just in my head was like, "Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it." He's like, "You like Star Wars?" Yeah. You don't like those new ones though, right? And it's like, what am I going to do? I'm in this car for the next 25 minutes going to the comedy store. I want this guy to get me there safe and I'm not going to get into the debate. And I, you know, and, and, and that's what I just got to like, that, that's, that's a, you go your way, you go mine. And then I, I'll even be like, oh, I do love it. I didn't deny it. I do love it. Oh, I don't like it. it it's this, it's that. Everything he's saying is hundred percent fact in his mind. <laughs> you know, And I just go, okay, cool, man. That's kind of where it ends sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm the same way um, in terms of like wanting to handle the conversation so it doesn't become horrifically unpleasant for either person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, you're touching on, on a, another thing, two, two ideas that are really important to me. And one is uh, saying our opinions as facts. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that particularly in uh, like critical analysis and writing, that's that's the way we communicate in culture yeah. is yeah. we 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 say our opinions as facts um but that's always like any any sort of critical setting that's with the kind of cultural agreement that i've read the text i'm responding to the text i have made an argument now i'm supporting it providing supporting evidence right mm. uh but that sort of critical approach to we we speak in facts because it's a stronger way uh yeah, to yeah. write critical analysis has seeped into real life <laughs> yeah. where so many of us say our opinions as facts. And I don't know if that will ever change. I really wish that that would change because I think it, it just, it doesn't bother me at all for have somebody say, I really did not enjoy the last Jedi. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'm actually curious to go, Oh, I did, but I'm interested in your opinion. Why didn't it work from you? So I feel like stating opinions, even when I disagree with them, opens the door to a conversation and understanding. And I might not agree, but I might learn something about this other human being, about what they like in Star Wars or movies or, or what was going on in their life in 2017. Uh, and, and it becomes something that we can exchange. But for me, it's just, it slams the door when everything is a statement of fact. And I think that's what makes people defensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Sully's the ability to have more, more substantive conversations yeah. is when you just start with uh, the book of Boba Fett is crap. <laughs> yeah you are automatically on defensive right because you're trying to disprove a fact mm -hmm. um and it, this is a it's a it's a real difficult slippery conversation because uh, there's some amount of we, we speak in facts even when they're opinions and that's mm -hmm. probably not going to change but i so want it to because i want us to have better conversations where we l can like learn and understand and not immediately go on the defensive just because we disagree about a space movie yeah, yeah, and that's something I, I I have to start at home with that, right? Where where uh, there, again, there's little tiny things along the way that if someone comments or tweets, sometimes on the rare occasion I respond, it's like I just can't let that lie, I just can't yeah. let what you're saying lie, and I'm gonna let you know about it. But but I, I have to work past that, and so it's always about what we work. You know, we lead with joy here because at Force Center, because otherwise, why am I gonna waste my time? <laughs> Right. This is why I'm on a Star Wars podcast and I left the general movie, movie podcast world because I, I just don't enjoy movies like I enjoy Star Wars. It's a different game for me. So I wasn't going to sit around there. And and I what I think I, I when sometimes the defensiveness pops up for me and, 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 and going back to Steve's question is it can be around a family dinner or a lunch with friends. It's not about Twitter or podcast wars or the battle to be more gooder <laughs> over what your Star Wars takes are. Um, I hate when that's, I hate, I use that, I, I hate I, when, that's when my simple joy, and it's simple, my simple joy is often confused with putting my head in the Star Wars sand. Mm. And that's where I'm like, you're very wrong about that. You haven't had conversations with me, um, but I lead with joy because otherwise, why am I here? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that, I think that is another part of it. We get defensive because like in my, uh, in in my mind, I'm totally fine with other people having different opinions. And it honestly wouldn't bother me at all to see somebody go, oh, I didn't like that. But when I see a bunch of takes saying it was awful, these people behind the scenes for sure did this awful thing that is not verified, you know, uh, it, that feels more like it's telling me 
it, like it's robbing my joy of just like, I was happy and excited about this. Now I see eight statements of fact that the thing that I liked was actually, you know, yeah. horrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- that, that statement of fact that, um, and, and for me, you and I have discussed it a lot lately of it's utterly valid to discuss uh, the behind the scenes uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. But I prefer just analyzing the text because I think that we uh, get obsessed with things we've heard about the behind the scenes. Like, honestly, a lot of the book of Boba Fett takes that um, w- that that challenged me were because people were making assumptions about why it was done. It, it wasn't about engaging with the text. It was, uh, I am assuming that it is a fact that Disney told the creators to put Grogu in it. And like, mm. maybe that's true. I don't know. We don't know. I'd rather engage with the text because we don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a weird, you know, I think we're just seeing in the human mind uh, how it works and how it's always worked, but it's on display. I, I don't play Wordle, but there was a th- thread going around I saw this morning. Did you see this about the, the conspiracy theories about the New York Times and Wordle? Did you see this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've been playing Wordle and you, I was, yeah. yeah. And I don't think it's gotten more difficult, but that was the opinion that spread on Wildfire that yeah. it is absolutely for sure gotten more difficult. And, and, and the fact is it's gotten less difficult because they removed dis- difficult words and, it's, <laughs> and, and, and that's nothing new. None of it is new and we're dealing with it on large scales here. Um, and all that, it gets overwhelming. And Steve, your question is, and, and it, it, it is, um, I think we've gone beyond maybe even just the question, but one of my final thoughts on this, Joseph, is too, is as the Star Wars uh, person, guy, uh, whatever in your community, I sometimes, it really bothers me when someone seeks, out, seeks me out Hey, Star Wars person, what'd you think about it? And I go, oh, God, I loved it. And they go, uh-huh, uh-huh. Anyways, it sucked. And I'm like, <laughs> why did you okay, ask me why for you my ask? opinion? Yeah. And and know your audience. Sometimes I've been asked, uh, some, believe it or not, some of my friends are big Star Wars fans, not on Twitter. <laughs> Don't know. Hey, man, I the Book of Boba Fett series is uh, over. I'm going to I'm gonna binge it. Should, should I binge it? And I, I need to either, based on who that person is, go, yes. It is a important uh, self-help manual of a Star Wars show that's about all these X, Y, fill in the themes from weeks of Star Wars discussions. Or I go, yeah, Boba Fett rides a Rancor. <laughs> and both are valid. You're, you're a good friend to know what your friends like, what will they'll be engaged by. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, final thing for me is I just want to make, uh, since we went off to some tangents and effort yeah. to well, <laughs> answer it's a Steve's tough actual yeah. question. Yeah, I, I think we... It's a tough time, and I think we're we're you know I think all of this is legitimate to to investigate why do we get defensive, you know what can we do about that because it is ultimately we can only control ourselves and it's our responsibility to you know mm-hmm. handle whatever comes comes at us. Um, so I did want to share because I have been in this position a couple times now in extremely different uh, contexts, everything from Zoom business Zoom calls to friendly Zoom calls that have nothing to do with this, but no one wants them to explode into a large Star Wars fight. I've had this happen in uh, Hollywood meetings where I'm trying to pitch something and like I can't, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I, here's what's actually worked for me to, to directly answer Steve's question is I want to remember that Star Wars is for everyone and that a lot of times people don't have the point of view that I have of spending this much time thinking about it. So I yeah. want to, like Steve is saying, don't want to go into, well, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I always try to acknowledge the other person's uh, perspective. Um, it's because I had a, had a lot of people, particularly in the heat of the sequels, that say, you know, well, I, I, I didn't like this in some way or it's bad in some way. Uh, so I w- I'll always try to start by acknowledging and saying either something like, yeah, it's not for everyone, or I've certainly got my criticisms too. So I acknowledge their perspective. And then I really try to segue into I or my opinion statements and say something like, yeah, oh yeah, no, th- I've got some criticism of the sequel trilogy, but I really like them. They they hold uh, together really well for me and I, and I really enjoy them. And see if that's it or if the person's like, asks, like, yeah. well, wh- in what way, how? And then I'll, you know, try to throw something out and, uh, and oftentimes it's, it's not a longer conversation and that just diffuses it. And they're just like, okay, well, yeah. I was hoping to vent about how dumb it was, <laughs> but, but this, uh, this guy isn't going to do it. The other thing that, uh, I wanted to be sure to bring up because it's a, a, for me, it is a tribute to our listeners. I often bring up the great perspectives that I've learned from doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, 
like I've had a specific moment like this where there was just that kind of a drive by, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, assassination of, of the prequels uh, yeah, yeah. In, in a context that where I just like this can't become an argument, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I tried to do the same thing of acknowledge like, yep, I, I agree that there, yeah, there's some rocky moments and some, you know, uh, stiff dialogue or, or acting moments. But, you know, I get to, I do this podcast and I get to hear how much people who grew up with those movies, a lot of them really love this. And I've heard personal stories about Attack of the Clones getting people through a hard time or I've heard from people who identified with Anakin. I've heard from women who their mind was blown that they got to see a 14 year old, you know, leader tell those middle aged men what to do. And yeah. those middle-aged men just did it. That means, means a lot to people. And that has often diffused it um, mm -hmm. to just to offer the lived experience that I've had the opportunity to hear from our listeners. It, mm -hmm. it, it slides the conversation away from, you know, uh, bashing to the conversation then obvious often segues into generational change or a, a surprising take that they heard it from a, somebody about other pop culture and it it uh just diffuses the mm. it's good it's bad fight <laughs> yeah yeah no look and we uh, media criticism has become just more and more surface level i think it's become uh, scrambling for for moral high grounds at time we live in a sins of the movie era ding uh, and 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 that's that's kind of that even that's become just a tired conversation for me uh i don't care about all that i care about exactly the stuff you talk about and 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 what this all means to me if you, yeah. want, if you want to have that conversation over Zoom with me, we'll have it. Yeah. And and I think you your answer pretty early on was uh is the ultimate answer for me is just pick your favorite Jedi um and try to be like them. You know, yeah. not not Anakin when he's angry. Uh but for me, you know, it's Obi-Wan. Just let it go. You can't control them. No mm -hmm. one can take your opinion from you. You know, there is a strength in that, right? Of like yeah, I sometimes I almost imagine a really difficult <laughs> Star Wars encounter like that it's it's Maul and Kenobi in the desert of like I understand you're angry but it's just not going to phase me <laughs> yeah yeah there's a strength there so great question thank you for letting us go on a bit there Steve uh hope uh we answered your question as well as uh questions in our own minds any any more thoughts before we move on to our final question Ken nah yeah no I'll I'll I'll, I'll fail and um succeed with this challenge all week long yep Yep, I have I have failed in moments as well and uh, try to have more victories and failures. What else can you do? Yep. Move on to our final question from uh, PQ. PQ says, hi, Joseph and Ken. What is the coolest Star Wars find in the most unlikely place you've ever stumbled across? Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I found pristine hardcover copies of the first two books of the 90s Zon trilogy at a gas station little free library. I had lost my original copies purchased at a B. Dalton the moment they came out. And I was overjoyed. Thank you both for what you do. Uh, the compassion and kindness you bring to Force Center has influenced my fandom in my daily life. That is very, very kind. Uh, I really did not pick all of the questions that were complimentary. <laughs> 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 Just happened to be a lot of nice compliments. So thank you all. Ken, what's your answer to this question? Where have you uh, discovered a Star Wars find somewhere you were not expecting to? Man, here's the problem. Uh, the, the, the answer, I, I, I don't, just don't think it counts. But it started, uh, it, it opened up the world of possibilities to what PQ is asking. But mine is, and I've, I know I, I know 100% I've told the story before, but it, it's finding the New Hope novelization at a used bookstore. Now, that shouldn't mm. count. Finding a book at a used bookstore? What are you talking about? But I was still y very young. Mom took me to the Nan's pre-owned books, which is still there in Grover Beach, California, a different location. But took me there. Hey, I'm going to get some books. You look around. I pulled out Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, and it was like, Star Wars is here? It's out here. I watched those movies on tape with the commercials, but they're here. And it was like, I didn't go to the the toy store to get something when like I had already been doing with Kenner. Right. It was like, this is a very adult, you know, adults are here to get books. Like what, what is this? This is, and, and, and Star Wars is here for me. And it was such a surprise that one day, and those are the copies I still have. I'm staring at right now. A little bit later on, I found Jedi. Um, and I've told the story of I needed to go back to the used bookstores to look for the Journal of the Wills, which is a book that clearly was out there that Lucas mentioned in the in the prologue here. But but that meant what PQ is talking about. I don't know if I've really experienced that elsewhere. Uh, go to a garage sale and find, uh, you know, a Attack of the Clones toy or something like that, you know. But every time I go, I'm always looking for Star Wars to, I think kind of relive that moment of utter surprise that there's star Wars in a place I didn't expect it as a kid. 
So even though yeah. I don't have a specific answer for PQ beyond that one in my life, because also I'm pretty much intentionally seeking out Star Wars when I go to stores and now, but just to turn the corner, pull a book and be like, oh my God, Star Wars is here too. I haven't experienced that, but I want to every time. Yeah, that's really, really great. Uh, yeah, but it, and it counts because you encountered Star Wars a place that you did not yeah. expect to, that you didn't know it lived, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> you didn't know that was a possibility, and then you had that spark when you went to a bookstore. Of, There's a possibility there'll be some Star Wars here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think for me, I've definitely encountered it, not things to buy, but it, in places I didn't expect to. Uh, there's a, a nice little cocktail place uh, relatively near to where we live called Lost Property. And it has this great theme of there's just like luggage everywhere. And it's kind of mm-hmm. like, it's very elegant and old school. And then there was just like, uh, uh, I think like a sippy cup of Boss Nass. Like that's one of the things that's been <laughs> lost on the road. <laughs> so I love it when I, when I discover even in like decor uh, Star Wars somewhere. But for myself, uh, it, going back to childhood as well, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, knew when there were times where I could buy an action figure and my parents would, it would be a part of a trip or they'd take me on a special trip because I could buy an action figure this week. And uh, that thrill. There was one time I went to my dad, I was li- with my dad, I was living in Portland, Oregon, and I don't know why I went with him, but like he just needed a hammer. Mm. And uh, somebody had picked up uh, the action figure of Greedo and just put him down with the hammers. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember just the utter shock and joy of uh, Greedo in the hammer section. And that's the Greedo I bought. That's the Greedo I have. Because I think it was a dad. It's like, ah, we came here for hammers, but <laughs> but here's Greedo. Um, and this is around the same time that, you know, my dad had uh, told me that sometimes when you get shot, you just get nicked. Right. And I was like, what's nicked? I'm like, oh, it just buzzed in the arm. And like, so I had decided Greedo just got nicked. <laughs> <laughs> in the gut (laughs) it's fine um so ever since then i've had that like like literally since i was a kid is like you never know sometimes they wander through the store you could find a star wars Mm -hmm. action figure in any section you never know maybe it's in the underwear maybe it's with the toasters you never know yeah what uh you made me think of another one though recently um uh, I, I, I December I did the comedy Washington DC at the comedy loft with with Mark Ellison the first night I, I put an Instagram photo of I walked in and it had been there before but I forgot we'd been there a year ago but they, they had a like a full-size Yoda on display <laughs> and I took a picture of it but and that was one of those like you know you don't in, in a comedy club you don't expect to find Star Wars even though nerd comedy and Star Wars jokes go over a little bit better than they used to that I'll say um yeah you wouldn't expect that and that, that made me feel like oh Star Wars is here it's gonna be okay yeah, yeah, it is great when uh, when Yoda and Boss Nass uh, <laughs> turn up in surprising places. That's a great question, PQ. I'm sure we'll think of even more of wonderful Star Wars and unlikely places we've discovered. But for now, that's the questions, Ken. That is the questions, and here's where you can find us if you want to say nice things or just yell at us. Guess what? It's all open for you to choose what to do with your time. On Twitter, we are at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. As I mentioned, subscribe there. Pretty soon, some live Q&As will happen on there. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We are available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and many more spots. Just search. You'll find us. Merch is available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. And you can support us directly at patreon.com slash Force Center. Always loving uh, having new patrons join us get into our discord to discuss star wars in a fun way every day you can follow me at ken Napsock, go to my website ken and uh once again uh, uh featuring st great organization that uh does all they can to raise money and awareness to help cure uh, childhood cancers uh, the research, all the stuff in it. And the reason I'm highlighting this and have been for the last few weeks is on March 5th, my friend Jeff Saunders, a uh, uh, great guy, is uh, part of do, uh, the St. Baldrick's Shave event where a bunch of people shave uh, their hair to help raise these funds and awareness. And you can support by going to stbaldricks.org slash participants slash Jeff Saunders 2022 if you want to support him directly or anyone on the team. Joseph. Yeah, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw. You can see some videos of my uh, Razor Crest birthing. Mm. <laughs> uh, probably a better way to advertise that. It's pictures of the box. It's safe. Mm-hmm. It's totally safe. Uh, so find me there. You can find more of the stuff I've done over the years and will be doing in the future on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. And I want to continue to highlight the great organization, Illuminative. Here's what the group has to say. 
Created and led by Native Peoples, Illuminative is a new nonprofit initiative designed to increase the visibility of and challenge the negative narrative about Native nations and peoples in American society. If you want to learn more about all their great projects, you can go to Illuminatives.org. Wonderful choice, as always. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for supporting. And and thank you all at times for uh, disagreeing or offering different perspectives, but approaching it in a nice way. That is definitely what we're here for as well. We are just here at the center of the Star Wars galaxy celebrating this crazy, wild, poignant franchise that we all love. Thanks for listening. This has been Foresight.